Uh, so with that, uh, take it away, Joel. OK, thank you, Carolyn. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, by now, uh, many or, or, or most of you know that small area census data were released about two months ago. Um, by the way, I'm hearing pinging. I, I just hope that nobody can hear the pinging as I'm talking. Uh, I hope that's not too disturbing because uh, uh, at any rate, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just press forward. Uh, so, so the data were released about two months ago. Our office uh, was particularly excited about these results because despite a lot of news about population losses, uh, New York City's population, in fact, grew substantially, outpacing uh, the nation and surpassing 8.8 .8 million people. Uh, the fact that the Census Bureau recorded uh, such impressive growth was no be by no means guaranteed uh, because our our population is real enough. The, the, uh, we know that the, there are people living here, uh, but the Bureau's count is essentially only as good as their list of existing addresses. So our office took full advantage of opportunities to update this list and ensure that we had an accurate count. So in this section, I'm going to explain a, a little bit about the mechanisms that we use to update the Bureau's housing list. And then I'll provide uh, a high level uh, overview of where we stand in 2020 and some of the notable ways in which our city has changed. Uh, but first, uh, let me uh, talk a, a little bit about how impressive these results were. So uh, before the latest redistricting data were released, New York City had uh, muted expectations for population growth. Really, uh, there were muted expectations uh, for the region in general. And uh, according to the Census Bureau's own estimates program, uh, the city was expected to grow by only 1.3% between uh, 2010 and 2020, while the country was expected to grow five times faster, uh, increasing by 6.7%. And you can see the paltry uh, expectations here in this graph, New York City's estimated growth, uh, the growth of its constituent boroughs and the region are all dwarfed by the uh, estimated growth uh, of the United States. Uh, so, lo and behold, once the census results came in, instead of the predicted sluggish growth, uh, we saw truly robust growth all across the city, but also surprises across the region. Uh, New York City grew at 7.7%, uh, outpacing the country and many other large cities. Um, defying predictions, each of New York City's boroughs far outpaced census estimates. So how did New York City end up with uh, such incredibly successful growth? Uh, at least part of the explanation lies in the fact that by and large, uh, the census is a housing-based census and only as good as its understanding of existing housing. So earlier I mentioned uh, uh, the Census Bureau's housing list. This list is known as the master address file or MAF. It's a listing of all housing units that the Census Bureau believes exist, whether they're occupied or not. If you are not on this list, if your housing unit is not in the MAF, then the Census Bureau will not contact you to participate in the census. You will not receive a questionnaire. And there's a good chance that you will not be counted. Uh, back in 1990, uh, there was a significant undercount of New York City's population, uh, missing nearly a quarter of a million people. We know this from retrospective quality testing. And in part, because of New York City's 1990 undercount, uh, the Census Bureau uh, began a program called LUCA, or Local Update of Census Addresses. Uh, LUCA provides a window of opportunities for localities to update the map before each census. So participants sign a confidentiality agreement, and the Census Bureau opens up their math, shares the math, and localities uh, let the Census Bureau knows, know where they believe that the math is deficient. Uh, because of this uh, LUCA program, we were able to provide the Census Bureau with almost 440,000 addresses back in 2000. And that really helped give us a, a population 
of, of 8 million. Uh, in 2010, we added nearly 200,000 additional addresses, which again helped the Bureau enumerate people who might otherwise have been missed. So now it's a good time to ask uh, a bit of an existential question. Uh, what does it all mean? Why does it matter that the Bureau gets the count right? It matters because uh, a good count is central to our congressional apportionment. Uh, so our count of congressional representatives is directly linked to the census enumeration. Uh, it matters uh, because it's used for redistricting. So the drawing of political boundaries at all levels of government. Uh, it's used in the allocation of federal funding. It's estimated that $2,600 per capita per annum in New York State is directly connected to our census count. And of course, uh, this audience knows that it's essential for good governance. So decision-making from city planning to our capital expenditures, to emergency management, to our public health officials that rely on it for epidemiological analysis. So it, it really matters. Uh, and for all of these reasons, just getting the overall count is perhaps more important than all of the other detail that we get from the census. So with full awareness of the high stakes involved, uh, in 2020, New York City upped our LUCA game and we conducted extensive field work. We had a core group of five staffers uh, canvas 5,000 blocks. That's one in eight blocks across the city. It's a lot of walking. And all of that field work was done essentially to corroborate uh, where alternate sources suggested that the Census Bureau's uh, master address file was missing units. But if we saw additional units in the field, of course, we would uh, include them in our submission. And we also conducted an in-office review of potential missing addresses using aerial and street view imagery and other sources. So how did we uh, conduct this field canvassing? Uh, looking at data from the Department of Finance and private vendors, we identified areas where it looked like the Bureau's master address file was discrepant. And we went to these areas and we examined indicators like doorbells. We counted doorbells uh, and converted garages uh, and mailboxes. We counted mailboxes and the number of uh, visible utility meters and basement entrances. And that gave us a count of units uh, for each tax lot that could be compared to the Bureau's count. And we really relied on our own observations because uh, building managers and, and, and owners and tenants are not always willing to disclose the existence of uh, additional housing units. So in the field, uh, we encountered all kinds of challenges that helped explain why the Census Bureau was missing units. Uh, in places like Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, for example, we found easy to miss units in alleyways. So there would be a rear alley entrance that without investigation would appear to be just part of the front facing entrance, but were in fact distinct units. And in the end, uh, city planning's 2020 LUCA operation was able to document over 122,000 addresses that the master address file had erroneously omitted. And the Census Bureau accepted virtually all of these units, 99.9%. And, and that distinguishes this LUCA submission from past submissions where we only achieved uh, an acceptance rate of 50 to 60%. And it's really a testament to the quality of, of this submission. And we also particip participated in the, the Census Bureau's new construction program, which allowed us to update the math with the latest information on recently constructed uh, housing. And through LUCA and through the new construction program, city planning added a total of 266,000 addresses to the math. And conservatively, these additional uh, addresses resulted in approximately uh, half a million New Yorkers being enumerated uh, who might otherwise have been missed. And, and based on the estimates that I mentioned earlier, this adds up to at least $1.3 billion annually in federal funding. So obviously we're very proud of that work and I feel like that has had a substantial impact on our city. So where does this leave us in terms of the results? Uh, 
Since the first census back in uh, 1790, New York City has been the country's uh, largest city, uh, and 2020 was no exception. Uh, not only is New York City the largest, it's also much, much larger than any other city, more than twice the size of LA, the second largest city, three times the size of Chicago, and almost four times the size of Houston. Uh, our population was larger than that of 39 states. And if it were a country, uh, New York City would rank in the top 100 ahead of Switzerland, Israel, and Serbia. Uh, if our boroughs were US cities unto themselves, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, and the Bronx would all be in the top 10, and Staten Island would be 38th, just behind Atlanta. And it's incredible to note that New York City gained an additional 630,000 people between 2010 and 2020. That's like swallowing up the city of Detroit or Las Vegas or Baltimore or the entire state of Vermont. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that the city accounted for three quarters of New York State's growth and now accounts for 43% of the state's population. And that will add up to extra political representation in Albany. So, uh, in you know, this recent release of, of census data, it includes geographic detail down to the block level, uh, but the characteristics that you get are rather limited, just the overall population, uh, housing, uh, population 18 years and above, and the breakdown by race and Hispanic origin. Uh, more detailed census data are due to be released next year, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation, but we will get the, we get this initial limited publication so that states can conduct redistricting and they can do so in compliance with legal requirements. Uh, but while limited, uh, we still get to dig in and see uh, our, our most recent racial characteristics. And that's what I'm showing here. This is a graph of the racial distribution for the 10 largest cities in the country, a reflection of that table that I just showed you. Uh, the categories for multiracial and other race in, in gray and black uh, really don't amount to a lot in any city, but consider the distribution of the four major race groups. Uh, New York City is incredibly balanced with sizable representation of, of, of whites, blacks, Asians, and Hispanics. And to help quantify this balance, I've added a diversity index score uh, to the top of the page. And the diversity index measures the probability that two people randomly chosen will be from two different groups. But you can also think of it as a measure of the balance between groups. Uh, the more balanced the distribution, the higher the score. And note that New York City's score of 76% is by far the highest. No other city passes 75%, and only three other cities uh, are greater than 70%. And perhaps, not surprisingly, uh, New York City's diversity dwarfs that of the country, 76% uh, compared to uh, just 61% for the country. So New York City's racial distribution is uh, incredibly balanced, but the same can't be said for the trajectories of change. Uh, while only about 3.5% of our population identified as multiracial, this segment uh, of the population increased by an incredible 150,000 uh, people, uh, doubling between 2010 and 2020. And you can see that in the uh, chart on the top left. And while Hispanics also increased, the percent increase of 6.6% uh, was actually slower than that of the city overall. And the real uh, incredible story regarding growth was the increasing uh, Asian population uh, with an additional 345,000 Asians since 2010. Uh, this group accounted for about half of the city's growth, uh, up 34% since 2010. Uh, the black population declined by 84,000 uh, since 2010, or, or five percentage points. Uh, and the white population registered very slight losses, but remained essentially unchanged. So those were the changes by race for the city overall. But if you look at this map, um, if you look at this map, you can see the dynamics really varied by borough. Uh, and uh, uh, in Brooklyn, for example, uh, we see that the, the, the that white and Asian gains are accompanied by uh, black losses. Uh, and if we dive in deeper uh, to the neighborhood level, we see even greater uh, variability. 
Uh, so this is a map of Brooklyn where neighborhoods showing, there's a lot of detail here. Uh, this is a map showing where, where uh, I've highlighted in blue neighborhoods uh, where the white population uh, has experienced uh, sizable uh, increases and in red uh, areas where uh, the white population has experienced sizable uh, uh, losses. And so it, it's really interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a tale of two cities, uh, both within Brooklyn. Uh, all across the North, we see white gains, uh, uh, mostly accompanied by uh, black losses, but also uh, to some extent, Hispanic losses. Uh, while all across Southern Brooklyn, uh, we see white losses are accompanied by Asian growth and uh, sometimes uh, Hispanic growth as well. So with this, this deep dive into New York City, I will hand it back over to Dara, who will zoom back out uh, for a regional perspective on these numbers. Thanks, Jewel. And I think I'm going to share my screen in a different way. So hopefully that will address some of the tech issues you guys seem to be encountering. And hopefully you can see uh, my full presentation now. Um, but to assuage my fears of bandwidth concerns, I'm going to just turn my camera off for the presentation and I'll pop it back on for Q&A. Um, so hopefully that addresses some of the challenges you guys have been having. So I'm Dara Goldberg. I'm the Assistant Director of the Regional Planning Division, and I'm going to build on what Joel shared and, and contextualize some of what you've seen for the city with what's happening in the broader metropolitan region. Uh, before I get started, though, I want to give you a quick definition of what we mean when we say the region, hopefully a refresher for most of you. But when we talk about the region, we're talking about the tri-state area seen here with the five boroughs of New York City in dark blue at the center, surrounded by 26 counties uh, with New Jersey in shades of, of green, New York in shades of blue, and Southwest Connecticut in yellow. We also break up the region for analytic purposes into these large chunks that we refer to as subregions. So the mid and low Hudson Valley, inner and outer New Jersey, Long Island and Southwest Connecticut. This area roughly represents a 75 mile radius from our city hall and in the before times, what we considered our daily commuter shed. Uh, and I'll note that this geography is different from the US Census Bureau's boundaries of the metropolitan statistical area, but this is the geography that of the region that we use. So the 2020 census enumeration, as Carolyn said, found that there are 23.5 million people living in our region. It's a historic high. Uh, the largest share of which live in the city, 8.8 .8 million people representing 37% of our metro's population. So, you know, slightly lower share of the metro's population than the share that, that Joel mentioned of the state. Um, and the next largest area is this area west of the Hudson River, inner New Jersey, which is of course not a formal geography by any means. It's inner to us here in New York City, city relative to the rest of the state of New Jersey. 13% uh, of the region's population lives here on Long Island, and the remainder is somewhat evenly split between Connecticut, the combined Hudson Valley, and outer New Jersey. Within these areas, you can see the region's population is densest at the center. So each dot here represents 500 people. It's darkest in the city with high concentrations in the older suburbs uh, on Long Island to the east and to the west in inner New Jersey. And there are clusters of density along the region's transit corridors, for example, here along the Connecticut coast uh, rail lines and the I-95 corridor. Over the last decade, the region added 1.3 million people with New York City gaining the most around 629,000, followed by inner New Jersey, which added about 375,000. Together, the city and inner New Jersey accounted for a disproportionately high share of the region's growth. So these areas combined were 76% or a little over three quarters of the metro population gain since 2010, despite the fact that they housed just 60% of the metro's 2020 population. And if you look at the rate of population growth since 2010, you can see that only the city and inner New Jersey gained population at a slightly faster rate than the US average. Um, Southwest Connecticut grew population the slowest in the region by just 2%, so one third of the metro's average growth rate of 6%, and other parts of the region, like the Mid-Hudson Valley here in light blue and Long Island here in the starker blue, also grew at rates that fell well below the U.S. average. So now looking within those subregions, looking at the rate of population growth for all 31 counties in 2010, with the colors here representative of the parent subregion, few counties grew near or above the US average increase of 7.4% represented by this vertical dashed line here. 
So of the seven counties that outpaced the U.S. growth rate, Hudson and New Jersey increased the fastest in the region, growing by 14 percent, followed by New Jersey counties, Ocean here in outer New Jersey, um, and Essex neighboring Hudson and inner New Jersey. In New York, Brooklyn, Rockland, Queens, and Orange counties all also grew faster than the U.S. average. And now if you layer in the next tranche of counties, so those that grew below the U.S. average but above 5%, you can see that the region's most significant population gains occurred in the city and, but for Westchester, in those counties located west of the Hudson River. Um, as we've noted in our previous reports, the geography of jobs and the ins and outs of NYC commuting, that lopsided growth has implications for the region's transportation infrastructure, particularly those connections to Manhattan, which prior to COVID were at or well over capacity, and were especially strained by the substantial population growth that is now confirmed by the 2020 census enumeration. And furthering this exploration into the connection between population growth in the last decade and proximity to regional transit with access to Midtown Manhattan, we also looked at an approximate 90 minute transit trip zone to Penn Station or Grand Central terminal represented by this beige shape here and it was modeled by our friends in the transportation division here at city planning so if you layer in population gains in blue and population losses uh, in orange that accrued by municipality so so these population change for each of the region's hamlets villages towns and cities we found that 87 percent of the region's 1.3 million population gain occurred in those municipalities that overlapped with the transit zone and that includes New York City. The share of population growth in that zone is higher than the share of people that live in that transit zone. So 77% of the metro's population lives in this 90 minute transit shed uh, to Midtown Manhattan, but it was close to 90% of the region's growth. So the pattern over the last decade is one where the region is disproportionately adding population in its densest areas, most notably in the city and adjacent areas, as well as proximate areas with direct access to Midtown Manhattan. And also, I'll just note that if you remove the city from this total, you'll still observe the same pattern where a disproportionately high share of the region's growth outside of the city has concentrated in those municipalities in the transit zone. So now I'm going to zoom all the way out a bit and, and look at population growth in the 15 largest U.S. metropolitan areas since 2010. So our region grew the most. Um, it just edged out the big Texas metros, Dallas, Fort Worth and Houston. Again, we added, so we added 1.33 million people and Dallas Fort, what, Dallas Fort Worth felt just shy adding 1.31 million and Houston gained 1.2 million. So despite them both being much smaller than our metro, about one third of the population size, they added nearly as many people. And so on a percentage basis, our metro's growth of 6% lagged most of the largest US metros and again fell below the US average. Over the last decade, Large metros in the South and West grew much faster than the US average, while metros in the Northeast and Midwest, notably the older metros, grew more slowly. And as I showed you just a couple of slides ago, our metros population growth concentrated in our higher density areas, our more built out areas, driven largely by those uh, by the city in those approximate areas west of Hudson, which was contrary to the shape of population gain in these fast growing metros in the south and west, particularly those that are characterized by some urban growth, but coupled with far more significant outward expansion. Um, so looking at our metros population change over the last hundred years or so by decades, so starting with growth in the period of 1900 to 1910 here at the far left and ending with this decade's growth from 2010 to 2020, the last decade represented the second largest population growth in the last 50 years following that 1990 to 2000 decade, uh, but was less sizable than decades in the earlier half of the century. And as Joel noted, there was that undercount um, that had happened. So there was notable growth in that 2000 decade here. And breaking apart the uh, into New York City versus the rest of the region, New York City in the dark blue, uh, which again represents 37% of the metro's 2020 population, accounted for nearly half of the region's population growth in this decade. So that's marking the highest share of regional, the city's highest share of regional population growth since the 1930 to 1940 decade here. The city experienced its second largest decade growth since 1920 to 1930. Um, so that includes, again, that, that large growth decade in 2000, um, while the rest of the metro experienced its second largest population growth since the 1960 to 1970 decade. 
Uh, both the city and the rest of the New York City, again, had larger gains in this in this 2000 decade um, where there was that change in, in, in approach to making sure there was a higher quality count. So now I'm going to layer in some age characteristics. So we're looking at the population by its youth population under age 18 in the darker orange and its adult population age 18 and older in the lighter orange. Um, you can see in these pies, which are all sized by their total population, that the distribution of around one fifth children to four fifths adults across the region generally reflects the US average. So 22% of the US population in 2020 was under age 18. And in the region that ranged from 20% in New York City, so slightly older than the national average, to 24% in the lower Hudson Valley, so slightly younger than the national average, but generally nowhere in the region veered too far from, from this split. However, if you look at population change by under 18 versus over 18 in the last decade, it's very clear that the region is aging. Um, all of the population growth since 2010 is attributable to an increase in the adult population, so these light orange bars falling to the right. Everywhere but the lower Hudson Valley, uh, which saw a very tiny increase in the under 18 population, everywhere but the, the, the lower Hudson Valley saw a decrease uh, in, in the population under 18, with Long Island's loss here of 61,000, the largest, followed by Connecticut's loss of about 40,000. Long Island accounted for a disproportionately high share of the metro's decline in population under 18. It was around 40% of the region's losses, despite housing just 12% of the region's youth population. And now looking at percent change, you can see that the, de the decline in youth population is even more pronounced when you're just looking at this rate. So Long Island, which experienced the largest net decline of youth population in the region, also saw the largest percent decline of about 10%, um, which is nearly seven times the national average here. Southwest, and Connecticut, Southwest Connecticut and the Mid-Hudson Valley, which lost fewer population, lost less population under age 18, um, but on a percentage basis, was not too far behind Long Island. And the other dynamic I'll point out that you can observe here is that in most parts of the metro, excluding the city and inner New Jersey here at the top, grew their adult populations more slowly than the US average, and they lost their youth population faster than the US average. And the confluence of those two patterns characterized their overall slower population growth, which is an exacerbated reflection of broader national trends in declining birth rates and an aging population. So New York City and inner New Jersey, which again grew population slightly above the US average rate since 2010, more closely mirror that breakdown for the, um, that you see here in the national average at the bottom of change by age. So now just focusing on the percent change in youth population. So the percent change in population under age 18 by county. You can see that the greatest losses occurred in areas that are furthest from the core of the region with the exception of Ocean County here in, in outer New Jersey. In those rural, suburban, and exurban areas, the decline of population under age 18 since 2010 well exceeded the US average, which is, falls in this light gray band here. It also exceeds the NYC metro average, which is this light peach color here. But the geography of areas that either declined in under 18 population less or actually grew generally mirrors that earlier map I showed where population growth is concentrating in the city in those areas west of the Hudson River in this band here. And so breaking that down even further and now looking at a dot density of the gains and losses of youth population mapped by municipality, despite widespread losses and you know little orange dot, dots throughout the region, there were a few select areas that grew population under age 18. So you can see some concentrations of blue here in Brooklyn and Manhattan and along the uh, New Jersey coast and into Essex County. But most notably are these three outlier towns. Um, you have Lakewood Township in Ocean County, Monroe and Orange County uh, and Ramapo and Rockland County. Lakewood had the largest gain in youth population among metro municipalities. It, it gained 26,000 uh, people under age 18, followed by Ramapo and Monroe, which also includes the new town of Palm Tree as of 2020. Uh, in each of these municipalities, not only did the growth in youth population exceed the growth in adult population, all three counties where these towns are located would have lost youth population, but for these towns. And while we can't really know this from the data nor specifically attribute this growth from the census data, I will point out that these three towns are home to very large Orthodox Jewish communities. 
So now shifting to look at the composition of population by race and Hispanic origin from 2000 here at the left to 2020 on the right and following the Census Bureau uh, classifications and the ones that Joel just described for different race groups. So you have the share of population that is white non-Hispanic here at the bottom in teal, black non-Hispanic in yellow, Hispanic in, in uh, purple, Asian non-Hispanic in red and other uh, and multiracial non-Hispanic in gray, you can see that both our region and the nation have become more diverse over the last two decades uh, the, with the decreased share of the white non-Hispanic population. Uh, the metro's population went from 57% white non-Hispanic in 2000 to 46% white non-Hispanic in 2020 and is now for the first time less than 50% white non-Hispanic. Um, and the US's population went from 69% uh, white non-Hispanic in 2000 to 58% white non-Hispanic in 2020, um, so still majority white, but increasingly diverse. And um, before I move on, just a side note for brevity, I'm going to use shortened terms. So when I say white, black, or Asian, for example, I'm referring to these same categorizations as, as they are non-Hispanic written here. So looking at the composition of the population by race and Hispanic origin for metro subregions, you can also see that all parts of the region have become more diverse. Shares of the white population decreased in all subregions, balanced by some notable growth in the share of Hispanic population in purple, as well as Asian population in red and other and multiracial population in gray. Uh, despite the increased diversity, though, over the last two decades, other than the city and now for the first time in 2020 in New Jersey, most of the region is still majority white. Uh, this is particularly true for the Mid-Hudson Valley in outer New Jersey, where the share of white population had been and still remains much higher than the U.S. average. Um, so reflecting that shift in shares and now looking at the actual change in population for the New York City metro, the metro's population growth since 2010 was characterized by gains in the Hispanic, Asian, multiracial, and other race populations here, a combined growth of 2.1 million people that offset declines in the white population, as well as some modest declines in the black population, a loss, a combined loss of 784,000. Um, the multiracial and other non-Hispanic populations accounted for the smallest share of the metro's population in 2020, similar to what Joel said for the city. It was 4% of the metro's uh, 2020 population, but it represented 25% of this 2.1 million gain since 2010. Um, some of these patterns may relate to shifts in how people self-identify in 2020, which the Census Bureau itself has as much positive, but it's difficult to fully understand the scope of that effect. And I think all of this is to say there is a very real trend of an increasingly diverse region. Looking at population change by race Hispanic origin for the subregions, the white population declined everywhere. Uh, with the largest decrease in inner New Jersey here, a drop of around 242,000, and the smallest decline in New York City, a marginal loss of about 3,000. Gains of the Hispanic, Asian, multiracial, and other race populations more than offset the decrease in the white population. New York City was the only subregion to register a decline in the black population, a loss of around 84,000. And gains of, of black population um, in other subregions were nearly enough to offset the city's loss. Um, but the metro in total declined that black population again by 16,000. So looking at this on a percentage basis, so now looking um, at the, the, this is here, the New York City metro change in the lower right hand corner and then the subregions, you can see that on average for the metro, the Asian population grew um, the, the, I would say the second fastest, the other and multiracial populations grew extremely fast, but among these four major race groups, they, they grew the fastest. Um, and that at a sub-regional level, that was true for the city where the Asian population grew the fastest, as well as for Long Island and inner New Jersey. While the Hispanic population grew fastest in Connecticut, in the lower Hudson Valley, in mid-Hudson Valley and outer New Jersey. In most areas on a percentage basis, the white population declined at a slower rate than those gains I described for the other uh, race groups. And again, the modest increase in, in black population outside of the city, as you can see in yellow here, um, was almost enough to offset the loss experienced by the city of four and a half percent. So a less than 1% change for the metro overall. Um, and again, I've excluded other race and multiracial population growth rates from this chart because they really grew so fast they would blow out the scale. Uh, the multiracial population increased by 110% for the region on average and other race populations increased by 99% for the region on average. Um, and that rate was very consistent in all subregions, so near or more than 100% for, for those two groups. 
Um, and lastly, just switching to the geography of population change by race Hispanic origin for uh, the metro municipalities, there's a few overarching patterns. So here in the top left um, as a baseline is the map again of total population change. The white population here declined region wide, but for a few select areas at the center. And then you also see uh, Lakewood and Ramapo popping up again. Remember, this combined decline represents a 7% um, decrease relative to the 2010 metro base. The, the you know moderate black decline, uh, black population decline in the city was balanced by some gains and losses in adjacent areas, but but that activity was modest overall. It's pretty distributed throughout the region. Um, or in plain terms, the, the change map here appears the lightest and the least filled in compared to the other other maps. The growth in Hispanic population here in the lower left hand corner as well as the growth in the other uh, other and multiracial population here in the right hand corner was fairly distributed and spread throughout the region. But the growth in the Asian population was a bit more concentrated, um, especially in New York City, in areas uh, in inner New Jersey, going down into Middlesex County, as well as in parts of Nassau County across the border. And so lastly, getting into the, the deepest cut here, if you break down the change in population by its youth versus adult split, so under 18 on the left and over 18 on the right, as well as by race and Hispanic origin, you can see that population growth across the board was attributed to this increased diversity. So outside of New York City, the growth in population under 18 was due to gains in the Hispanic, Asian, multiracial, and other race populations. Those gains, however, here, were not enough to offset the losses in, in white and black black populations under 18. And so that's why overall the region declined in its youth population. Though the white population uh, age 18 and older also declined, the pattern of an aging population here on the right was not unique to any particular group or geography and all populations that grew were also aging. Uh, so I know that was probably a lot of data and information, so I'm just going to take a brief moment to summarize some key takeaways. Um, one is that our region's population has reached an all-time high of 23.5 million, but that growth has been fueled by gains in the city and areas west of the Hudson River, as well as disproportionately in our transit corridors connecting the suburbs to Manhattan. That has implications for our infrastructure as we emerge into this eventual post-COVID future. The second is that our region is aging and aging faster in areas that lost population or grew more slowly, especially those areas furthest from the center of the region. And while that effect is a bit tempered down at the center, overall we are losing youth population at a rate in excess of the national average and that has implications for the region's economic competitiveness, like the future of our, our, of our labor force and how we collectively plan. And lastly, our region has become more diverse and we've benefited from that trend. Our increasingly diverse population has not only helped our region to grow, it's been the only driver of our youth population growth, uh, which serves to counterbalance the threats of an aging population that I just mentioned. Um, so I'm just gonna take a couple of moments to plug some interact interactive map and data platforms and resources that we maintain. So first is our division's Metro Region Explorer, where you can find most of the data I've shared today, as well as other economic housing and commuting uh, data for your municipality, your county, your subregion. You can see how it compares to other places, and you can also download the data and play with it and explore on your own. Tomorrow, and Joel can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think tomorrow the Population Division's Population Fact Finder will also be released with 2020 census data for the city. It will also report at some of the new geographies they've created, like reporting for the city's community districts. Um, these tools and our reports and other resources are available online and somebody can drop these links in the chat, hopefully, uh, and accessed on our respective websites, nyc.gov slash population, nyc.gov slash region. Um, and so now I'm just going to kick it over to Joel. Um, Joel, I'm going to leave my slides up so I can share the, those links um, to the resources you put together. But if you want to take over, I will um, just stop talking now. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> um, uh, so, so yes, uh, uh, just on that topic, uh, Population Fact Finder should be up and running Thursday, but but almost definitely by Friday. And that will have the new 2020 census numbers and the change over time for uh, New York City and, and all of the small area detail. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is a bit of a, a, a call to arms. Uh, what's happening is that uh, in September, uh, the Census Bureau uh, requested public feedback on their proposed 
2020 census products, so the, the products that uh, have yet to be published. Uh, and what's concerning about their proposal is that <clears throat> um, the upcoming, the, the plan for the upcoming products will not give us all of the detail that we had in the past. And notably for us, uh, the proposed release is missing uh, detailed race and ethnicity data down below the county level. So that's very generalized, obviously, in New York City. Um, so, so the data that show us groups like Puerto Rican population or Chinese population, uh, the, the, that, that detail will not be provided under the current plan below the county level. Uh, so we're very concerned about that. And the Bureau's plan does not include uh, the age, sex, household data that uh, below a county level. Uh, and that's damaging for us because we use this for our small area projections and, and our planning. Uh, so uh, very quickly, you can see our, our proposed solution in a letter that we've posted. Uh, here's a link to it. Uh, that we intend to send to the Bureau tomorrow. Uh, we encourage you to look over this letter. Uh, feel free to use any of our language and provide your own feedback. And unfortunately, the Census Bureau did not give us the biggest window uh, in which to provide feedback. The deadline for this uh, is Friday. So um, hopefully you're able to uh, rip off some of our language and send a, uh, uh, some feedback to the Census Bureau. And, and with that, I think we're going to turn to questions. Is that right, Dara? Yeah. I'm trying to find my teams. Thank you both. Um, uh, uh, really fabulous presentations. I think we had the first question, uh, which Joel and Peter, I wonder if you want to comment on, um, uh, specific to uh, whether uh, you have any insights into why the pop estimates were so off for our region um, and how much we should think the growth uh, from 10 to 20 is, you know, quote unquote real or uh, due in part to a better job in counting. Sure. Uh, the, the Census Bureau does not have a good, very good track record, a record where estimates are concerned. Uh, in 2000, it estimated the city's population for 2000 at 7.5 million and the population came in at 8 million. Um, in 2010, the estimate was 8.4 million and the and the numeration was 8 million 175,000. So, um, you know, they don't have a good track record, uh, record. And of course, they, you know, they create reality, right? Uh, especially in, in the intercensual period. Uh, this go around um, uh, the last decade, the city was, you know, they showed the city increasing by 1% a year, which was phenomenal, you know, uh, rate of growth we hadn't seen for over a century. And we kept on telling them the city really can grow at that rate. And then they sort of flattened the growth and then we you know, they really pulled back substantially. And uh, it seems like the estimation of migration was off. Uh, they are looking into it. It's very likely the migration component that was off. Uh, and but by the way, Jersey's differential was even greater than ours. Um, uh, Connecticut also had a huge differential. Now, in terms of growth being, you know, real versus, you know, uh, population missed in 20 uh, in 2010 uh, I would say most of the growth is real uh, and why do I say that um, so in terms of you know what we gave the Census Bureau in Luca you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of folks are saying you know this growth is only because city planning did a very good job in Luca and gave the Census Bureau you know 265,000 units in Luca and in new construction and of course that certainly played a huge role uh, in, in the 8.8 .8 million figure. But if you look at new construction, you know, the 165, the 143,000 units that the Census Bureau had missed, all of that is post 2010, right? So even if you apply, you know, a 20% vacancy rate, um, and if you, if you look at, you know, our LUCA numbers and you say, you know, 122,000 units in LUCA, and let's assume a third of those units were there in 2010 and missed by the bureau and basically just two thirds were subdivided or you know found for the first time you know post 2010 you still get you know a, a sort of a, a population in in the uh, in, in the ballpark of about half a million added post 2010 so so I, I would say you know a good chunk of the of the growth is real um, it's you know given the low estimates you know we've been conditioned to think in a certain way but as I said, this has been an issue every decade. Thanks, Peter. 
Um, next up, Dara, I wonder if you want to comment on what we know and what we don't know yet about uh, households by income uh, regionally. Right. So we haven't looked at this by income because the income numbers haven't been released yet. So what I've shared is the extent of what's been released. You can look at income using ACS data, but what you're working off is a completely different estimate space. So what Joel showed at the beginning of his presentation is how um, how much the Census Bureau underestimated what our region's population would be in 2020. And so there's just a little bit of apples and oranges going on if you use an older ACS to, to work off of the current change in the population using the census estimates. Um, but I also think that there's a question about the ACS release in 2020 that maybe, Joel, you can talk to and, and we can talk about how we're planning to look at some of these things um, going forward. Yeah, the, the, the ACS release, the, 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 they were, they, the ACS has been impacted by the pandemic and the quality uh, really affected uh, their response rates. And so they weren't able to collect a sufficient sample size in 2020. And consequently, they're only releasing experimental data for the ACS in, in, in 2020 for their one year. They will release a five-year period estimate, but like Dara said, um, that will not be controlled to the 2020 census. And they're be, in, in places like New Jersey and New York uh, City, there, where there's a great disparity between the estimates program and our 2020 census, you're going to get numbers from the ACS that are that are odd, uh, and and not to mention that that uh, uh, when you when you look at uh, economic elements like uh, income, there's there's a, a a temporal disparity. I mean, they're just not it, 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 it's 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 too far in the past when you're considering 16 to 20, especially with the dramatic changes that we've just recently underwent. Thanks, Joel. I, uh, I, I'm, I see another question, which I think is specifically to, uh, regarding the uh, Census Bureau revising its POP estimates going forward as well. Yeah, so the, the Census Bureau uh, normally once the enumeration is out, um, you know, what they do is they go back and they backcast all the, the prior estimates so that they line up with the enumeration. Right. So, as you know, the the estimates were pretty low and we ended up with 8.8 .8 million. And so what the Bureau normally does is it goes back and revises each of the estimates you know, for the intercensual period. Now, they've done that every, you know, after every census and we expect them to do that you know, this go around. But we don't know when it's it's hard to pin down the Bureau on on anything. Uh, at this point in time, given the you know the whole issues, the the bunch of issues they're dealing with in terms of differential privacy, in terms of the ACS data, you know the pandemic uh, era data, and so on, but we do expect them to go and buy and, and backcast those estimates. And perhaps keeping on the same theme of uh, uh, confusion and and concerns over when and what we'll know from the Census Bureau, uh, there's another question about journey to work data specifically and when when and what we'll know from those releases. Uh, Joel, you want to go ahead? It's, it's an ACS. Uh, you, you know, it's an ACS uh, product and uh, we don't know how differential privacy is going to affect it. Uh, it was an issue even before differential privacy, you know, came to the fore. Uh, a, a lot of unknowns, a lot of unknowns. Yeah, and I also just think, I mean, this is just sort of conjecturing how people would respond to a survey question of where you worked last week in a COVID time. I don't know what the results of that survey would actually generate if we have these high telework or like a very different employment picture in 2020. So I think it will be interesting to see from an ACS perspective what that will be. As far as the CTPP, you know, they just released the 2012 to 2016 product last year. Um, so I don't know when we would be getting anything that's below a, a Puma level on journey to work for for a few years, at least I anticipate. I don't know if anyone has more recent information than that, but. I wonder if you also want to mention the challenges with the CTP and track level uh, 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 flow data. 
Yeah, so the, the 2012 to 20, so in the previous products, the Census Bureau, it's, it's a custom journey to work data that are not through the ACS are a custom product that is commissioned from the Census Bureau to prepare for transportation planning entities. And um, previously the methodology had been to impute data to the tract level so that you had this 100% count, but it was fully modeled. In 2012, 2016, um, the Census Bureau change their methodology and their approach. And so they're only reporting data that are known. And so there are just huge gaps in the data when you get below the county level. Um, they feel it's more representative of what the actual surveys show, but they it is less complete. Um, so if you're using those data to get a count of the number of people who commute from A to B, that number will not be a complete number. Um, it might not have been a real number before, but it was also more complete with some margin of error around it. So. Um, but I feel like that's a different wormhole we shouldn't <laughs> open up right now since there's other questions like on FactFinder. <laughs> uh, let's move in. Tanya asks, um, is it safe to make the assumption that a big reason for the decrease in white population is, quote, less kids or is the increase in non-white just exponentially different? So I think this is really getting into a question of dynamics of change. So um, the, the white population decline was minimal. OK, um, and white fertility is actually going through the roof. OK, so if you look at uh, natural increase, which is the difference between those born and those dying, uh, it was negative for whites, you know, up to around uh, uh, 2000 into the early 2000s. It's now positive and highly positive. Uh, and I've got to double check the latest information, but I think uh, the number of white kids born now exceeds the number of black kids born. Uh, so it is not an issue of fewer births. Uh, as you know, in uh, you know the white population is also aging. So we've got uh, you know the uh, whites living in southern Brooklyn and eastern Queens uh, who are aging out, um, and uh, you know oftentimes succeeded by Asian groups. And then you've got, you know, white population in central Brooklyn increasing, and you've got very high fertility uh, in those areas. But overall, uh, natural increase is positive and growing over time. So the decline, if you want to talk about the decline, it's, it's more out migration and people actually dying, the older white population. Great. I think that that is the entirety of questions. I'm just scrolling through to make sure we haven't missed anyone. I, of course, see a number of kudos to the team. Great presentation. Thank you from uh, myself and my CUNY class. Well, that's wonderful to hear uh, that we've got CUNY in the room today. Oh, I, um, think, I, see, I think I see a quick question just on um, Fact Finder. Are you going to update? Uh, the underlying data with the 2020 for using 2020 tracks for the older ACS data, if you want to. That, that's a great that's a great question. Yes, we 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 will. Um, so we we're doing a conversion uh, to to take the we offer change over time using ACS data. And so we've taken older data and we've converted into 2020 um, <clears throat> geographies, uh, we've taken the 15 to 19 ACS and converted that into 2020 geographies with the next release, uh, the, the 16 to 20 ACS release, even though it's not controlled to the 2020 census, it will be released in the latest 2020 geographies and that's great. Uh, and so we will eventually not have to employ any kind of mathematics behind the scenes, but, but right now, yes, we will release the uh, ACS data in the new 2020 geographies when FactFinder goes live with its update this Friday. Uh, I'll also add that uh, you know less than 24 hours after the data were released, we actually posted you know data, uh, 2010 census data and 2020 <coughs> census data uh, in 2020 tracks data for community districts, uh, 10 you know uh, 10 data and 20 data. Uh, and data for NT for neighbor tabulation areas. So if, if you want those data in Excel format, it's, it's all available on our website. And of course, with Fact Finder, it'll make it much, much more easy. Uh, it'll make much more uh, easy to access those data uh, through Fact Finder. But those data are already up on our website. Great. Well, with that, uh, I uh, would encourage everyone to unmute for one moment to just give a big round of applause to our presenters for today.
And we thank you all for making the time. Uh, we hope you'll use the resources uh, that we've put out. All of this information will be put out on the web, so keep an eye out for it. Um, and uh, we encourage you to continue uh, and sign up for our Thinking Regionally newsletters to make sure that you're getting information about webinars and, and, and opportunities like this in the future if you're not already uh, a subscriber. Uh, thanks so much and have a great day to everyone.